After about age 40, all of us are suffering from neurodegeneration. The question is just to what degree? So there are several reasons that it works for brain function. One is that it's the fastest way of getting into ketosis. So not only when you're fasting, you're, you're not only restricting uh, fat and protein, you're restricting carbohydrate, and that's what starts ketone generation. Mm -hmm. Second thing is it upregulates a process called autophagy, which is like a cellular cleanup and repair process. Like the garbage truck. The garbage up truck up all of the cells. cells. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, like, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, human beings often had periods of food scarcity where they were in fasting, you know, probably involuntary, <laughs> not, not something they were choosing to do. But we evolved in that environment, and so our bodies come to expect these periods of food scarcity and even depend on them perhaps for these important cellular repair and cleanup processes. Mm -hmm. So the third thing that fasting does is it, it upregulates stem cell generation. So it actually can create completely new cells. And if you're suffering from any kind of neurodegenerative condition, this is absolutely crucial. And the reality is after about age 40, all of us are suffering from neurodegeneration. The question is just to what degree? <laughs> right. So if we do things like fat, fasting and ketogenic diet, and, and it doesn't have to be all the time. I'm not, you know, obviously you can't fast all the time. <laughs> You're not gonna make it very long if you do, but cyc cyclical periods of, of fasting and ketosis. So for do you example- mean completely no food? Uh, there's that, different ways to do yeah, it. So yeah. one way, I don't generally recommend pure water fasts because they can cause cramps and electrolyte, you know, imbalance, and they're often really difficult for people to do. But like a bone broth fast can be a really good option because the broth contains a lot of minerals, phosphorus, and thing, magnesium, things that can help prevent the, the cramping and the discomfort. Another popular option these days is called a fat fast. So you eat maybe 400 calories per day of pure fat in the form of medium chain triglyceride or MCT, or even exogenous ketones um, that you can buy now over the counter and supplement with, or perhaps just some coconut oil uh, in your coffee, like, you know, bulletproof like a bulletproof coffee, coffee yeah. type of thing. Uh, and what this can help to take the edge off the hunger a little bit, but it also speeds up ketone generation because you've got more fat coming in and this fat in, you know, makes it easier to get into ketosis, so it can help you get through that uncomfortable period more easily. So it's a fat fast that makes you skinny. Absolutely. <laughs> and it you know, totally amplifies your brain power at the same time. So you know, there are different ways of fasting, and uh, you know, talk about the concept, but let's get a little more granular about different ways of fasting, because most people are probably hearing this going, well, I'm not gonna stop eating. Yeah. You know, do you yeah. do it for an hour, for a day, for a week? There's so many different ways of fasting, but I'll cover the ones that are most popular and I think are most effective. So one is called intermittent fasting. There's been a lot of research and media attention on this lately. And uh, one of, you know, inter intermittent fasting can take many forms. It could be alternate day fast, so you eat one day, you don't eat the next day. But the form that seems to be most doable for most people is uh, compressed food intake. So it means you only eat food in an eight hour period during each day. So you, you eat between 12 p.m., let's say, and 8 p.m. And then that means you're doing a 16 hour fast from 8 p.m. until 12 p.m. the next day. So you're doing an intermittent fast each day. You're skipping breakfast essentially and not eating until noon. But during that morning period, you could, if you wanted to, have some coffee, for example, or tea with some fat in it, um, just to help with the ketone generation and to help take the edge off the hunger. So, so that's one way. So then, no more haagen before bed? <laughs> <laughs> no more haagen before bed and, and no bagel with cream cheese right when you wake up. Um, then there are more extended fasts. So these could last anywhere from one day to seven or even 14 days. And, um, you know, three day fasts have become more popular. I see more and more people trying these. In some ways it can be more difficult though, because the hardest day when you're fasting is the second day, typically. That's when you, you really start to be hangry, as you suggested, you know, the hunger gets intense. And if, especially if you're not used to it, it can be really challenging. But by the third day, most people report feeling like elevated mood, clear, heightened clarity, focus, attention. They start to actually really enjoy it. So if you end on the third day, you're kind of like continually getting the hardest part of the fast and less of the benefit and the enjoyment from it. Mm. 
if people are going to do seven day fast, it's generally to, better to do it under the supervision of, of a physician because there are, especially if they have kind of a low body mass index, because there are some issues. Meaning you're skinny. Yeah. Like you and I. Exactly. <laughs> There's something called refeeding syndrome that can happen if you start, once you start to eat again, it, it involves an electrolyte and imbalance and it's pretty rare, but it can happen in people who are really skinny, who do an extended fast. Um, if you're overweight, there's less of a concern and it can really help with weight loss, of course, too, because you can you generally lose about a half a pound of fat a day when you're fasting. So that's another benefit of fasting is the, the metabolic reset. If we now are understanding brain conditions to be, not just for <clears throat> diabetes, for your brain, because now we understand that a lot of brain conditions, neurodegeneration is caused by metabolic problems. So if you're resetting, hitting the, hitting the reset button on metabolism, that's going to have big benefits for the brain. Mm. I mean, at, at a fundamental level, the brain is so important because it's the mediator of our entire experience of the world. Everything that we experience, every thought that we have, every feeling, every sensation that we have is mediated by the brain. So if the brain is not healthy, you know, we're, nothing will work well. Um, and I always start with the basics. The basics are really easy to overlook. It's easy to focus on supplements and yeah. all the sort of hacks and advanced tricks that you can do to support your brain, but that's all pretty worthless if you're not doing the basics. Um, so diet is often the starting place, as you pointed out. And uh, first of all, just a, a really nutrient dense diet is I think the most important thing because the brain needs a variety of nutrients to function properly. And these include B12, B6, folate, DHA, choline, zinc, copper, all of these play a really vital role in the brain. And studies show that a significant number of Americans and people in the industrialized world and in the developing world are deficient in these nutrients. So we have a diet that's dense in calories and rich in calories, but really poor in nutrients. Yeah. So that's, I think, the first thing. But then, yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, people don't realize people have a very high calorie and nutrient poor diet. So it's calorie yeah. dense, nutrient poor. The question is, what is a nutrient dense diet? Yeah, that's a great question because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I think people, when they think of nutrient density, the first thing they think of is, is vegetables, perhaps. And certainly vegetables are very nutrient dense, particularly in uh, phytochemicals, antioxidants and things like that. But when you consider essential nutrients like the vitamins and minerals that I just mentioned, as well as fatty acids, most people might be surprised to learn that animal products tend to be more nutrient dense uh, even than vegetables in that case, and particularly organ meats and shellfish. Liver. Liver. <laughs> uh, you know, you always hear me talking about liver. But any organ meat and shellfish as well are super, super nutrient dense. So just like three ounce serving of oysters, for example, one time per week will meet your entire dietary need for copper and zinc for that week. So if you're talking about bang for your buck, organ meats and shellfish are super nutrient dense. And and most, course, people, most people think that those meats are protein only, right. but they're actually very rich in minerals and vitamins and antioxidants. And They think they're protein or they think they're just big blobs of saturated fat that should be avoided because <laughs> of all the fat phobia that we've had for so many years. And fortunately that's, transitioning, I think, at this point, but... Thanks yeah, to you and... And you, you know. <laughs> and many other people. Um, but these, 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 uh, these foods are, are really nutrient-dense and should be a part of a, a healthy diet that, of course, includes vegetables and fruits, whole fruits and nuts and seeds and a wide variety of plants. So, so that's number one. But Beyond that, um, and, and beyond what I hope it are the obvious steps like re removing processed and refined foods and sugar and you know minimizing stuff that comes in a bag or a box, which is really comprises the majority of what many Americans are eating these and days. And it's not just because they make you fat, it's because they're neurotoxins. They're neurotoxins and they're like, totally depleted in, in nutrients. They're, again, they're high in calories. You know, we're, we're well fed, but we're starving for nutrients. That's another way to put it. Um, and the more cal empty calories that we eat that don't have nutrients in them, the worse our brain is gonna function. So that's, that's the basic level. But then there are some tweaks or hacks you know, that, that we can do with diet that can uh, 
potentially uh, prevent and reverse neurodegenerative conditions. So if someone is already su starting to suffer from neurodegeneration, like early onset dementia, Parkinson's, things like that. And even for healthy people, these can, can increase brain function. So one of them is a ketogenic diet. What is that? So uh, ketones are produced when we <clears throat> restrict the intake of carbohydrates and to a lesser degree protein. And these ketones substitute for glucose as a fuel source for the brain. And the brain, there's, there's <clears throat> quite a bit of evidence that suggests that the brain actually prefers ketones to glucose as a fuel source. And that's especially true when people have conditions that inhibit the brain's ability to use glucose. So this has been referred to as like type three diabetes, mm -hmm. where the, the brain's <clears throat> use of glucose is impaired, and then ketones can substitute for that glucose and make the brain function better. And we have a lot of studies now that show that the ketogenic diet improves mitochondrial function in the brain. It increases GABA signaling, which is a, a major neurotransmitter. It increases the expression of something called glutamate synthase, which mops up extra glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter that can cause harm if there's too much of it in the brain. And uh, these ketones just have, uh, in some cases, a pretty miraculous effect in conditions like epilepsy or again, Parkinson's, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. But when healthy people do a ketogenic diet, what they often report is increased feelings of mental clarity, focus, and attention, mm -hmm. and uh, just feeling a sense of alertness that you know, they have, haven't felt in years or maybe have never felt in their entire life. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I, I recall, you know, I'm a physician, see patients, and, you know, I've used this therapeutically in patients with dementia who mm -hmm. came out of, you know, fog and were able to converse, remember things. I've done it with autism, kids who are violent and very disruptive, uh, dramatically change their behavior. And in Parkinson's, you know, just see, you just see the power of food as a drug. Yeah. So most people think of food as just energy. I'm eating to get energy, but they don't realize by understanding the nuances of how to use diet as a drug that you can either help or treat or prevent or even reverse many common problems with everything from depression to anxiety to autism to ADD to Absolutely. Alzheimer's to you know Parkinson's and uh, you know we we don't use that I mean it's being used in 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 clinically in epilepsy you mentioned even it's being researched in Alzheimer's even yeah. in brain cancer mm -hmm. to reverse brain Ketogenic cancer diet for glioblastoma yeah. Yeah. yeah so very powerful tool so let's talk about something else you share that's not too common in a medical prescription, which is being in nature. Yes. And how, why is that important and how does it affect our brain? Well, again, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, if human, you know, humans have been around or hominids have been around for, for about 2 million years. That's 66,000 generations. Way before there were skyscrapers. <laughs> Way before iPhones and skyscrapers and, and, you know, working inside. We spent most of our time outside and we lived in nature, natural environment with, you know, the natural rhythm of light and dark and slept outside. And really, you could say nature is hardwired into our DNA. Fast forward to today when the majority of people spend the majority of their time indoors, completely disconnected from the natural environment. And what studies are showing now is that spending time in nature down, down regulates or dials down the prefrontal cortex, which is like the command center of the brain. So it, it basically allows us to, you know, step away from that command and control kind of mentality and it relaxes that prefrontal cortex and allows the brain to rest. That's probably the easiest way to think about it. And there's actually even a term now that's been coined called nature deficit disorder. And it's rampant, especially in kids. It's thought to be a, a risk factor for ADHD mm -hmm. and autism spectrum disorders and all kinds of other brain and neurodegenerative conditions in both kids and adults. So I think it's really important and often overlooked. It's great, you are mentioning your kid goes to a forest she school, goes to a forest where you school. go in the forest and you that's, just play right. and have fun, you know. Yeah, which is what kids at that age should be doing. She's yeah. almost six, so. I mean, it had a huge impact gone. on me when I was a kid. I, I went on canoe trips, was riding horses outside, was camping, was, you know, being in nature a lot of the time. And, and it really, I think, imprinted on me the, that as a therapy. And for Absolutely. me, it's, it's kind of my go-to therapy. And they're now doing that with kids uh, uh, who have ADHD and depression, anxiety, and other 
behavioral problems. They're sending them on essentially on camping trips mm. where they don't take any technology. They're, they're not allowed to play video games or they disconnect from their phone. And the first few days are really hard for the kids. But then all of the kids almost unanimously report feeling a sense of calm and well-being that they haven't felt you know, possibly ever mm -hmm. in their life. And mm -hmm. they want to go back and they want to keep doing it. So it's really powerful. So there's something else that you sort of talked about, which is sort of related to this, which is this concept of circadian rhythm like, yeah. and, and how that plays a role in our brain and our hormones and our neurotransmitters, which uh, is basically how we live in rhythm or out of rhythm. So can you talk about that in the brain? Yeah, this is really fascinating because it, it goes way back, way before humans, actually all the way back to the, the first single cell organism that evolved on this planet. So we're talking about <clears throat> billions of years here. Every organism that ever came to be on this planet evolved in the 24 hour light and dark cycle that we have on planet mm -hmm. Earth. Mm -hmm. So every cell of every organism is entrained to that 24 seven, you know, light dark cycle. And we now know that in humans, that light dark cycle affects every aspect of our physiology from our endocrine system and our hormones to our brain function, to our metabolism, everything. Sleep. Sleep, of course, sleep. <laughs> Most importantly. Most importantly, sleep. So what happens, you know, essentially our bodies were, are hardwired to expect a period of light and that followed by a period of darkness. And when we wake up in the morning, our bodies start producing cortisol which is a kind of like get up and go hormone. And then when night falls, it starts producing melatonin, which helps us to fall asleep and stay asleep. So the problem is now, you know, in the last 150 years, we've developed artificial light, which is awesome. It allows us to be more productive and, you know, entertainment and art and all, all kinds of things are possible with artificial light that weren't before. But the downside of that is now we can sit in our bed at 11 o'clock staring at our iPad which is emitting blue light, the same spectrum of light that the sun emits. And that basically tells your body, oh, it's time to wake up, time to get the cortisol production going. And then the melatonin drops, totally messes with your circadian rhythm. And then that can have downstream effects like increasing the risk of obesity and metabolic disease, increasing the risk of depression and anxiety, mm. seasonal affective disorder. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know even that flight personnel and people who do shift work are at much higher risk for cancer. And heart disease. And heart disease. So Diabetes. this just affects our immune system, our cardiovascular system, everything. So uh, getting cl closer to the, that natural rhythm of light and dark is really important. It doesn't mean we all have to live in a tent in the backyard, but we can take steps to... Can we put a mattress in it? You could do that if you want. <laughs> I mean, actually, it would be really good for you, but... Um, we can do things like, for example, if we have to use a computer at night, there are now glasses that you can buy that filter out the blue light that comes from those screens, or even mm -hmm. if you're watching TV. So if you came to my house at night, you'd see my, my wife and I <laughs> wearing these funny glasses with kind of an orange tint mm -hmm. uh, that filters that light out. You can, you know, take steps to not try not to use electronic media within an hour or an hour and a half of bedtime because that... Uh, you know, has that effect that I just described and then get some bright light exposure during the day. So if you work in an office or in an in indoor environment, make sure to go outside for a walk at lunchtime or, you know, in the morning, take a walk, make sure with no sunglasses, make sure you let that light hit your retina and stimulate that cortisol production. It's basically like candle therapy. When the sun goes down, switch to candles, uh, get off your screens. Absolutely. And if you can't, wear those funny glasses. Yeah, turn the lights <laughs> down, get some mood lighting. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it's, you know, it's pretty widely recognized now, which is why even computer operating systems now, like the latest update for Mac, their, their latest uh, uh, operating system has something called Night Shift. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people might not even know that this is on their computer, mm -hmm. but you, when you turn night shift on, what happens is when the sun goes down, the screen, uh, the, the, the type of light that's emitted from the screen changes. It becomes warmer, which is meant to mimic more of a night, the kind mm -hmm. of light that you would be exposed to at night, not during the daytime. Yeah. So this is really well-established research. It's gone so far that computer makers are now incorporating this into the, the operating system. Yeah, you know, we have these LED lights, and fluorescent lights that we're exposed to all the time that have a huge impact. You know, Cleveland Clinic, we created a, a clinic that is 
meeting environmental standards and also health standards. So, right. so we actually change the lighting. We it doesn't look like a hospital when you go in there. No, we change yeah. the air filtration. We change the materials that are in there to actually optimize well-being. And we know we can actually access the brain through all these external inputs, light, sound, music, touch, taste, and, and environment. All these things are really powerful so doorways important. that we can access the brain that we don't even utilize as, as, as brain therapy. So this Absolutely. is really pretty exciting research. So let's talk about ways of, besides the obvious, which, you know, we've talked about diet, exercise, we didn't chat on, but it's a powerful tool, meditation. I want to get into um, some of the hacks you talked about, some of the doorways, that, given all the stresses of our life, given the deficiencies in certain activities or nutrients how do we how do we use substances that are available to us through sub diet or through supplements to actually optimize brain function right so this has been a an area of pretty intense study and 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 also experimentation within the biohacker community um, so there's a new class of nutraceuticals you know supplements and herbs and nutrients that, that provide a kind of therapeutic effect called nootropics and these are things that have been shown to improve cognitive function or have some aspect on uh, uh, some effect on brain, some aspect of brain health, like mood. And uh, I mean, that's it's a huge topic. There's so many potential things we could talk about, but I'm just going to mention a few of them mm. that I found to be the most helpful uh, with my patients and and uh, with my own experimentation. So one is is choline. Now, choline is is a very important substance found. You know that we need in our brain it's a, it's it's sometimes referred to as a b vitamin uh has important effects in the brain but it's in, in, importantly a precursor to acetylcholine so acetylcholine is a, is a neurotransmitter that is really heavily involved in attention and concentration and focus and by the way it's what goes down on alzheimer's absolutely <clears throat> it goes down on alzheimer's and you see and it's of course involved with memory and cognition in general. So we wanna keep our acetylcholine levels high and cho take choline as a supplement is one way to do that. Of course, choline is also in liver mm -hmm. and egg yolks and many mm -hmm. other foods, but so if, you know, if all of that's not working and you need an additional boost, choline can be really helpful. There are many different kinds of choline and ways to supplement with it. For the brain, I think the most effective form is, is alpha GPC which is a form of choline that's been shown to very easily enter the brain and have a bigger impact on acetylcholine levels. So that's number one. Number two is there's a whole class of acetams like paracetam, which is uh, similar to an amino acid called pyroglutamate. And what it does is it increases the activity between neurons. So mm -hmm. neurons are always <laughs> sending messages back and forth. And if you increase that activity, you increase the, you, you sort of enhance the cognitive function of the brain. So uh, paracetam does that and um, it's generally better. I found one, of the, one side effect of paracetam that can happen um, is headaches, mild headaches, and that, those are generally mitigated or alleviated if you take the alpha GPC or choline with the paracetam. Mm. So another one is uh, nuopept, which is a, a peptide that inhibits um, glutamate synthesis. So glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter, or excuse me, it, it, it basically increases the availability of glutamate in the brain. And so glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's one of those Goldilocks things. You don't want too much of it, but you don't want too little of it either. Because one of the main drugs for Alzheimer's blocks the effects of glutamine because yeah. it's overexciting the brain, over creating inflammation the brain. and brain damage. So I think you need to be, I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but all of these things are, um, you know, they have different effects on different people. And I encourage people, if they're gonna do these things, it's probably best to do them under supervision if they can, but if they are gonna try them, to take it slowly, you know, start with a really low dose, try only one thing at a time. Um, a lot of people uh, will stack nootropics, so they'll, they'll take, you know, three or four of them together that all have slightly different but complementary effects and, you know, to try to get the best effect. And, and that's not a bad thing if you are already familiar with the individual effects of each of them. Mm -hmm. So that's a caveat I should have mentioned. So start slow beginning. and build. Start slow and use one thing at a time until you figure out how it affects you. And then you can add other things in. Are these medication or supplements? These are supplements that are available over the counter. 
Um, and then, you know, plain old caffeine actually and coffee has been shown, is, they're, they're both, uh, they're not technically nootropics because they're stimulants, but they have nootropic effects. And caffeine, for example, I mean, it has many effects, but one of the big ones is it increases dopamine production. Dopamine is another important neurotransmitter in the brain, and that one regulates what we call executive function. So attention and focus and even motivation are strongly influenced by dopamine. So those are uh, four that fall into that nootropic category that can be helpful. Let's just talk about the caffeine and the coffee for a minute. You know, there's, there's evidence that it uh, depletes adenosine, which is the energy in the cells, it, that it in, depletes over time nor, norepinephrine and adrenaline, which are, so, so that you get this spike in these stimulatory hormones or neurotransmitters, and then you crash, which mm -hmm. is actually my experience. You know, mm -hmm. when, I, when I went to medical school, I started drinking coffee, and I would notice every afternoon, about three or four, I would just like want to fall asleep. And, yeah. and I connected it to the coffee. And so how do you sort of explain that? So the phenomena well, where you're, you're kind of artificially boosting these things and then you crash. So we can sp speak in general terms and then sp individual terms. And I think that's always important when we're discussing any of these topics. Um, if you look at the research on caffeine, overall, it's very positive. Um, it, I think, you know, there's some areas like you mentioned that, that raised, you know, potential for concern. But when you look at the research on a kind of net basis, you see positive outcomes with moderate, you know, mild to moderate caffeine or coffee consumption. Because it's it's not just the caffeine, it's also the antioxidants and the other compounds in the plant. Yeah, I mean, it, it, coffee, sadly, is the number one source of antioxidants right. in the American For diet. Most people, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think coffee on the whole can have a positive effect, but that's if it's in, if it's well tolerated by the, by the individual person. And we now know that there are a lot of genetic polymorphisms and, and factors that influence how we metabolize caffeine. So one person might be a, what we call a slow metabolizer. So these are the people like me and perhaps like you that if I have coffee after 12 p.m., my sleep you know, is tanked for that night. I'm not gonna sleep at all. And yet there are also fast metabolizers. These are people like my dad who can drink a cup of coffee after dinner and go to sleep and not have a problem. So there's a wide variation in how people respond to caffeine. Mm. And, and I think, you know, you have to, you don't necessarily know, need to know your gene status. You just, you know, <laughs> you figure it out yeah, sure. you know, kind yeah, of on your own. If you, if you drink coffee and you're, and you're like this and you can't <laughs> sleep and you're crashing in the afternoon, it's probably not gonna work for you. Yeah, yeah. And that's the same for any of the other nootropics that I mentioned, you know, some people take paracetam and feel really jittery and amped up yeah. and you know it, it doesn't work for them whereas they do better with choline and for other people it's the opposite so. i always say that the best doctor is your own body because it's right. going to tell you what works and what doesn't work it's, if you listen to it's it got the final word you yeah. can have all the best theories but if your body doesn't respond yeah. then it doesn't matter so you know in my own practice i've noticed that when i treat people's digestive system that their brain gets better whether it's autism or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or MS. And, and particularly we're now learning that depression and mood disorders, which we often thought were emotional, are maybe physical. And that the key doorway might be the gut. And yeah. in depression particularly, we're learning that it may be an inflammatory disorder, like mm -hmm. the brain might be inflamed from various factors. So talk to us about the gut and these mood disorders and how we can think about it, what we can do. It's really interesting because I feel like a lot of what we're doing in modern medicine is rediscovering things that we have known for a long time. You know, 2000 years ago, Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut, right? So he, all the way back then he knew something about that. And then even in, in the US uh, in the 1930s, there were a couple of researchers, uh, physicians at Duke University, Stokes and Pillsbury, who wrote a seminal paper explaining the gut brain skin axis, the, the, the connection between the you know, condition like disruption of the gut microbiome. There wasn't the term microbiome at that <laughs> point, but they were talking about lactobacillus, um, la you know, low levels of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria and conditions like depression or anxiety and also skin stuff, which we won't go into. But this was in 1930. It's like almost 90 years ago. Almost 90 <laughs> years ago. And then we lost that thread for you know many, many decades. 
But in the last 10 or 20 years, the gut-brain axis has been a really hot topic in, in the research literature and even now in the popular media. I think a lot of people have heard that there's a connection between our, the microbes that inhabit our gut and our brain, that things like intestinal permeability or leaky gut, when the gut barrier breaks down, that can cause problems with our brain and, and it, it may be connected to conditions like autism spectrum disorder, ADHD. And then as you mentioned, the most current theory on what causes depression is known as the inflammatory cytokine model of depression. So that's a fancy way of saying that when our gut becomes inflamed, it produces chemicals that travel through the bloodstream, cross our blood brain barrier and, and suppress the activity in the frontal cortex. And that produces all of the telltale signs and symptoms of depression. So, so should we take an Advil for our depression? Absolutely not. <laughs> That's actually going to make the gut worse over the long term. Uh, we know that Advil can, can cause ulcers and, uh, and a whole bunch of other problems in the gut. Uh, but what we should be doing is attending to our diet. You know, diet is a crucial factor for gut health. If we eat a lot of heavily processed and refined foods, that causes a pro-inflammatory microbiota, which means it feeds you know, pathogenic bacteria and bad, bad bugs. Uh, allows them to proliferate, and then the, they produce compounds that can be toxic to the brain. Let me stop you there for a minute. Like, there's, a, there's a fascinating research on the different types of molecules that get produced by bacteria. And in, 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 in our diet, we have high levels of propionic acid, which is yes. toxic to the brain, and it's been linked to autism and many other conditions. And most people are not aware that any bread products they eat or flour products have high levels of propionic acid because it's a yes. preservative that's mm -hmm. put in there. So if you eat at a fast food restaurant, you eat processed bread. I mean, if you make bread yourself, that's different, but it's a very common ingredient. We're getting huge levels. And the good um, products that come from a healthy bacteria called butyrate actually heal the brain. Yeah. So we're, we're not even aware of what we're doing to our brains by the food we eat. And it's, it's so connected. And yet, you know, just cutting out all processed foods and cutting yeah. out all fast foods and refined grains ha can have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. And then eating prebiotic foods, you know, these are <coughs> foods that can be fermented by our beneficial bacteria, like bifidobacteria that produce that butyrate that you mentioned is really important. And there's been a big decline in the consumption of these um, foods that can be fermented, fermentable carbohydrates. So these would be things like uh, onions and garlic, Jerusalem artichokes, um, some starchy plants, some nuts and seeds. They're all whole foods. They're all foods with, with fibers that can be fermented by our gut bacteria. And these fibers are really important because we can't digest them. We don't extract any nutrients from them. But the gut bacteria living, you know, the 100 trillion bacteria or microorganisms living in our gut can. So every bite of food that we put in our mouth, we need to think of how it nourishes us and how it nourishes our bacterial community because feeding both of those uh, systems is equally important. And historically, we ate a lot of fermented foods because that's how we preserve things. Sauerkraut and mm -hmm. kimchi and these foods that are are ways of preserving foods that otherwise would go bad. That's right. And if you look at <clears throat> hunter-gatherers, they consume on average, in many cases, over a hundred different plant species. Mm -hmm. you, get, you know, for <clears throat> Americans, it's like six or seven. Yeah. <laughs> Tomatoes and lettuce on burgers, you know, maybe uh, carrots and yeah. a few others and that's it. So when you have that lack of diversity of fiber and plant foods, your, your gut bacteria isn't gonna work as well. Yeah, historically, there was, you know, the original data on this was from Dr. Dennis Burkert went to Africa and found that the average hunter-gatherer stool weight was two pounds and the average right. stool weight of the industrialized group that was living in the cities was like four ounces. And they, you know, we eat about eight grams of fiber on average, maybe 15 if you're good yeah. in America. And, you know, we need over a hundred grams of fiber, which is a lot. They're eating over a hundred and most of the dry weight of stool <clears throat> is bacteria. And that's exactly what explains why their stool weighs more because it's full of this beneficial bacteria. Mm. So then there are other conditions. We know that infections like H. pylori, parasites, there's now been some peer reviewed published studies connecting fungal overgrowth in the gut, which used to be looked at as a sort of wacky, quacky, yeah. wacky uh, condition, but there was a study associating it with inflammatory bowel disease. And I recently saw a study uh, connecting it with worse outcomes in alcoholic liver disease. So mm. it's, they're starting to come out and say, okay, everyone does have yeast in the digestive tract. That's normal. 
But what happens when the bacteria that protect against the proliferation of that yeast become depleted? Or if you have an infection or some other, or you're eating foods that that, that yeast thrives on, then this Sugar. yeast becomes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's how wine is made, you know, we know this. So um, if you, if you have an overgrowth of yeast in the digestive tract, that's when things you know, can become problematic. And yeast produces aldehydes and other chemicals that can literally make us feel like we're drunk. Yeah. Um, there are actually, there are case reports of, you know, people who had high blood alcohol levels from eating too much sugar and flour right. that led to the fermentation of starches in their gut that really produced alcohol and they absorbed it and they got arrested for drunk driving. Right, right. And I know you see this in your practice, but I see a lot of kids with yeast overgrowth because kids are uh, these days are eating a lot of sugar and processed and refined food. They're not eating whole nutrient dense foods. And guess what? These kids have behavior problems. They have you know mood issues. Be, uh, they, they are not able to even attend school in many cases because of this. And when we treat the gut and we deal with the fungal overgrowth and the dysbiosis, they get you better. can see remarkable changes. You yeah. can see kids going from being almost nonverbal to, to speaking. You know, physical contact becomes a possibility where it wasn't before. You get they look kids, in your eyes. <laughs> they look in your eyes. You get kids getting off of these drug, these you know, Ritalin and, and other stimulants, and being able to actually participate in their lives. I mean, it's 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 amazing. It is, and it's all bad. just with the gut. You know, the diet and focusing on the gut. Chris, you're a practicing clinician, and you treat patients. Yeah. And you're not just making up all these theories, <laughs> <laughs> but you're connecting what you see in the clinic with the research, and yeah. then you implement therapies that aren't typical. And, and I'd love you to share maybe a few case stories of sure. patients who you approach this way through a different doorway mm -hmm. into the brain and what kind of outcomes you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, I had an 86 year old woman who was, you know, she had a diagnosis of dementia and early onset Alzheimer's. Um, her family members brought her in. She was living with her daughter and her daughter's husband and they had kind of reached the end of their rope. You know, they went through what most patients with Alzheimer's go through. They have a really expensive battery of tests. And then the doctor says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Here's a drug. And by the way, that drug has not been proven to even slow the progression of Alzheimer's, much less reverse it. And good luck. You know, I mean, that's essentially the plight. Uh, yeah, get your affairs in order and, you know, seek out some help for the family <clears throat> members and that's it. And uh, these, these people weren't, you know, didn't want to accept that, uh, understandably. And so they were seeking out other approaches and they came to, to see me. And uh, first thing I did was I put her on a ketogenic diet, uh, which is what I often do in patients with neurodegenerative disorders. And she, you know, until that time was eating a pretty standard American diet, a lot of flour and bread. She loved cookies and cakes and things like that. So it was difficult for her to make that transition, but her family, since she was living with her family, they made that easier. And within, I got a call from her daughter uh, a couple weeks later saying, I don't even recognize, this is like my mom used to be, you know, I haven't seen this person in 10 years. And she was, her memory was better. She could actually, uh, rem you know, her short-term memory improved. Uh, she was able to function in a way that she hadn't been able to. She was able to take care of herself. And this was just by doing ketogenic diet. And then we started to add some additional cognitive supports in some of the things that we talked about earlier, as well as some herbs like ginkgo and bacopa and ashwagandha that increase glutathione levels in the brain and are neuroprotective and actually can reverse amyloid, you know, can actually uh, get rid of some amyloid uh, formation. And then she started to improve further. So she was already fairly uh, far along the progression, she didn't recover completely, but she's still doing well. Years later, she's still doing that program and she hasn't progressed any further. So that's- Which is unheard of. Unheard of, completely unheard of. Um, the second case that comes to mind is uh, a child with pretty severe behavioral disorders. Um, he would basically uh, have, you know, it was, it was really, really hard for his parents. Like, even something like not his shoes not being tied correctly would send him like into a complete fit, spasm, you know, tantrum on the floor, beating the floor, um, you know, which was really problematic if they ever tried to go anywhere. 
And then, he, you know, he, he wouldn't use the bathroom anywhere outside of the house. So that it's, you know, really limited. He couldn't go to school for that reason, or they had to go pick him up at school and bring him home during the day. Um, he was very sensitive to any kind of contact. This is now referred to as sensory processing disorder. So certain, you know, types of clothing on his skin or even, you know, physical contact would send him into a tailspin. And I did a whole workup, mostly focusing on the gut and found that he had significant fungal overgrowth. He had a condition called SIBO, which is an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine where it shouldn't be. Um, he had, you know, disrupted gut microbiome. He had a lot of food intolerances. He was gluten intolerant. He was still eating gluten, but he was also intolerant of dairy and eggs and other, other food proteins. So we cleaned up his diet. We treated him with herbs and supplements for the fungal overgrowth. We used prebiotics and probiotics to support beneficial protective bacteria. And within you know, a month and a half of that, he was already coming off of the psychoactive drugs that he was taking. His psychiatrist called and said, you know, what did you do to this kid? I don't even recognize him. They, they got a call from the teacher at school saying, you know, where's this kid? You, have you sent his twin, you know, brother? Because they didn't, you know, they'd never seen him operate in this way and be able to get along with his peers and actually go use the bathroom at school and, you know, start to be able to function like a normal kid. And this was just with some simple, pretty simple dietary changes and some supplements and botanicals that you can buy over the counter and probiotics and prebiotics to support gut health. So again, this kid would have been on a lifetime of medications. Uh, he was already in the situation that a lot of people are in where they take one medication and that causes side effects. So then they need to take another medication to deal with that, the side effects of that drug. He was already starting that treadmill. And most kids, unfortunately, in that situation are facing a lifetime of that, just escalating more and more and more. It's so sad. But it's like the most rewarding part of my work is being able to help a kid in that mm -hmm. way. Yeah, no, I see this all the time. And, you know, what's striking is that you know, we often think of these things as behavioral disorders, but they're biological disorders that are caused by various insults irritating the brain and inflaming the brain. Yes. And when you take away all the stuff that's bothering them and you put in some good stuff, it's dramatic and it, it can happen very quickly, like in days or weeks. Absolutely. And, you know, I do recall a number of my patients who had the same story. One little girl was beautiful little girl, was like nine years old and was violent. Mm -hmm. And she would mm -hmm. attack her sister. She would get kicked out of class 10 times a day. She was on the bus home from school. They'd have to stop the bus and she would like cut her, you know, family right. out of pictures that she was in. It was just really powerful. And I, and she didn't have any gut symptoms. And I found that she had terrible overgrowth of yeast, terrible mm -hmm. bacterial overgrowth, like you mentioned. And I treated her gut and like, it was like the same story. It was, who, where is that kid? You yeah. know? And she yeah. was sweet and loving and kind and disrupted school anymore, could run on the bus home. And, and uh, how many of these kids is sort of are struggling like this that really we can impact through these doorways to the brain? I think you raised a great point <laughs> that all parents should be aware of, which is, when the problems in the gut don't always cause obvious gut symptoms. So that's tricky because when a parent sees the behavioral problems or the doctor for that matter, they don't think about the gut automatically. They don't think this could be a gut issue. So that's the message that we need to get out there. They just think it's some troubled kid or some exactly. bad kid. And, and, I mean, consider the effect <clears throat> on the kid. The kid spend their whole life thinking there's something wrong with them. They're, they're, they're bad. They don't, they don't fit in, you know, and, and there's some fundamental defect, which is just horrible for yeah. the child's development and self-esteem. But when they understand that there's actually something physiologically that's contributing to this and causing this, it's, it doesn't just improve their symptoms. It totally shifts their awareness, their self-awareness, their self-concept and can, can really dramatically change the outcome of their life for that reason. Starting what you're talking about, Chris, is you know reversing conditions that are irreversible, Alzheimer's, ADD, autism, depression, that people suffer with throughout their life. Mm -hmm. and, and this is relatively simple, changing your diet, changing your lifestyle, a few supplements, fixing some problems that occur that are common like the gut. Yeah. And you know, we, we are, are, are looking at a, you know, an epidemic of brain disorders in this country and around the world. Uh, yeah. And it's it's something we actually know what to do, but is sadly void in conventional therapy. 
yeah, we've been searching for the magic bullet, you know, a single drug that's going to treat each of these conditions. And that's just not the way it works. They're all multifactorial, which means they have a number of different causes and all of those causes need to be addressed instead mm -hmm. of just trying to slap a Band-Aid on, on the problem, which right. clearly isn't working, but it has been our approach in this country to chronic disease for the last several decades. Yeah. Um, you know, with one in two people now have having chronic disease and one in four having multiple chronic diseases and that just expected to increase over time, we're in big trouble if we don't make a shift in, in our paradigm and how we approach chronic disease. No, it's so true. <laughs> so true. We, you know, we, we just uh, kind of missed the boat on this. Yeah. Well, you know, our medical system evolved in a time where the top three causes of death were all acute infectious diseases like typhoid and pneumonia. So it was mm -hmm. like... You had one disease, you went to see one doctor, you got one treatment, and you were either better or you died. <laughs> Those yeah. are pretty much the, the outcomes. But yeah. today, you know, people have multiple diseases, they see multiple doctors, usually a different doctor for every different part of the body. Mm -hmm. Those doctors are not communicating with one another, not seeing it holistically, and you end up with this sort of patchwork approach that is, is not only ineffective, it's actually harmful. Yeah, we, we talk about evidence-based medicine, which means you've had to have something studied, single agent against a right. single disease, it's randomized controlled trials. The truth is that when we practice medicine, we're not practicing evidence-based medicine because we might have five drugs for five different diseases all in the same patient that's never been studied. And most of those drugs are being used off-label in many cases anyways for, for indications that they were never actually studied for. Or so approved like for. Abilify, for yeah. example, number one selling drug right now used for depression and behavioral issues it wasn't actually approved yeah. as an antidepressant it's true and and you know some of these practices of pharmaceutical companies to push these drugs for off-label indications has been found to be criminal and they've been actually fined billions of dollars but if they do they don't care because they're Drop making the more billions you know <laughs> yeah. they maybe find a billion yeah. but they made 10 billion so who cares yeah it's only the oil industry that makes more than the big pharma. So they, they got deep pockets. <laughs> sure. And then just one last thought, you know, sort of remind me of what you're saying, that functional medicine has a saying, which is based on the thinking of Sid Baker, which is called yeah. the tack rules. If you're standing on a tack, it takes a lot of aspirin to make it feel better. Get rid of yeah. the tack. And yeah, so you're talking absolutely. about like bacterial overgrowth or yeast in these kids. You can give them psychotic drugs or anti uh, depressant drugs or all these medications, stimulant drugs, but they're not going to work unless you get rid of the cause. And then yeah. the other issue is, there are many causes. So you, if you're standing on two tacks, taking one of them out doesn't make you 50% better. Yeah. So you've got to find and remove everything. Yeah. I like another analogy that's similar is like if you're in a boat and it's got a lot of leaks, you can bail water out and that might, you know, help slow the sinking. But mm -hmm. ultimately you have to plug all of the leaks, not yeah. just one for, for you to be able to stop bailing water. That's so so great. Uh, it's really important. And I, 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 I think we see some positive signs. It, things are shifting, moving in direction, thanks largely to work from people like you at the Cleveland Clinic and all of the pioneers uh, in the functional medicine community. Um, but I'm, I'm just you know, hoping it moves quickly so we can prevent <laughs> unnecessary suffering, in, especially in kids. That's really the, the take home here is that there's millions of people suffering unnecessarily and that we can end that suffering. So let's talk about this idea of, of time restricted eating because it, it, it's a fa and there are many ways to quote fast. There's what we call intermittent fasting, which is maybe not eating for a whole day or three days or a week. Sometimes there's time restricted eating, which is only eating with a certain time window. There's fasting mimicking diets, which are eating less calories for a number of days to stimulate the same pathways. There's ketogenic diets. They all do a very similar thing. So what, what is the biology of how this works? We know that these, these things do work looking at animal studies, human studies in terms of improving metabolism and the longevity biomarkers. But what, what are we seeing and how these methods actually work and what is the most effective? What should people be doing in, in order to take advantage of this new science? Right. So what they're doing, I mean, the, the way I explain to patients is, um, which I think is, is, I mean, it's doing a, they're doing a number of things, but it's triggering your body's own self-cleansing mechanisms. After you yeah. haven't been eating for a certain amount of time, 14, probably more 16 hours, your body's self-cleansing mechanisms kick in, which is very important with the aging process because one of the, the, um, 
factors in aging is your body is once and it goes back to functional medicine your the functioning of these systems don't work as well so the the fasting actually starts uh, putting that the, that autophagy system into play so i think that's probably one of the most important aspects you know it also will improve mitochondrial function which also decreases as we get older so the 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 consequences of fasting or what happens in your body are often the opposite of what happens as you get older so that's why i think it's so important why which way of fasting is best is the way that you'll do i mean whatever works easiest for a person is what i encourage and i think the easiest one for most people is to eat dinner earlier and eat breakfast later which yeah. is what I do and what I recommend. Now, if people want to do a day of just water fasting or three days or even more, that's great. That's a little bit more complicated and, and, and most people won't do that. But if you can do that, that's fine. There's also this fasting mimicking diet where you do five days a month of very low calories and no animal protein and low carbs. And, you know, we've actually created some shakes or my health coach has some recipes for people if they want to do it themselves you can buy the the prolon um yeah. shakes yeah. as well yeah. i don't know you you should bring out some shake i mean it's a no-brainer to bring out a five-day program of because it yeah. works i mean we've done it yeah. on patients that actually there's no yeah. question you get yeah. the same results whether you do a fasting mimicking diet for five days or you do intermittent fasting we're seeing positive results across the board with biomarkers and different types of fasting. So I don't think there's one way. I think the way is to find the way that you will do and that works easiest for your lifestyle. Yeah, you know, people, people say, Dr. Hyman, what do you eat for snacks? And I'm like, I don't. <laughs> I think snacking is the worst invention. Snack foods are typically really unhealthy and they're a modern invention and we used to not have to be eating all the time. And that's the problem, we're eating all the time. And I think, you know, just to underscore what you said about these different approaches to time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diets, is they activate a set of mechanisms in the body that improve blood sugar control, that get rid of belly right. fat, that increase muscle synthesis, that build your bone density, that increase testosterone, that increase brain function and cognitive function, that improve your stem cell function, that help your immune system. And they clean up all the debris in your cells. It's called autophagy, which we're saying sort of self-cleaning mechanisms. Uh, there's mitophagy as well that comes from right. from the same process. So these are these are things that we actually can take advantage about without actually changing what we eat. Now, if you change what you eat, you get a double benefit. But but these are very powerful things that we should be paying attention to in the science. And I think you just feel better. You feel more energetic rather than being sluggish from eating food all the time. Right. No, and you nailed it. Thank you. You, you. you know, all those mechanisms are what actually start, you know, their function decreases as we get older. It becomes harder to, to keep your blood sugar under control. Um, the muscle synthesis, all, all, you know, brain cognition and brain function. So fasting is like a magic pill um, or, yeah. or eating less and um, is a magic pill. So uh, it, to me, that's, yeah probably the most important thing you can do it's true and you know you mentioned the meat thing and i think it's still to me it's still the science is still controversial you know yes. I, I talked to my friend uh, walter longo who's one of the leading longevity scientists and he's from italy and he's the guy who developed the fasting mimicking diet he's been on the podcast right. and he <laughs> <laughs> and he said he knew this woman, Emma Murano, who lived to be 117 years old. And she was anemic when she was a young lady. And her doctor told her to eat three eggs a day, which she did for 100 years, <laughs> literally. And, and then when she was in her 90s, I think she was getting frail and weak. And her doctor told her to eat a pound of meat a day. And she did. And she lived from 90 to 117. So I wonder, you know, how... Yes. How true is this? And if your other uh, lifestyle factors are okay. good, if you're eating animal protein and getting adequate muscle benefit from it as you age, you know, where, where is that fine line in, in terms of animal protein? Well, that, I think this is the dilemma, not really a dilemma, but I think we all need to, you know, find what works for, for our bodies. But I, I think it also um, points out a factor that, 
in Western medicine, we always try and look for the one thing that works, and everything works together. It's a you no, know, we have this complicated system, and the mTOR issue may be one small part of it. So, I think you've got to find yeah. that balance. I, I I agree. I don't think. I mean, I know vegetarians who get cancer. You know, the the idea of animal sure. protein causing cancer. Vegetarians yeah. get cancer. Vegetarians <laughs> don't do well. You've got to find out what works for you. And once yeah. again, I'm not uh, trying to blow smoke up here, but uh, the, <laughs> pegan, the, the pegan concept, the pegan diet, I think, and finding your own type of pegan diet, I think, yeah. is is uh, if if we if we're looking for a solution, not yes. that there's a solution, yeah. the pegan diet in terms <laughs> Thank of you, food, Frank. you know, intimate <laughs> fasting, eating within that content, the time restricted yeah. eating, a pegan diet is the way we all should be eating. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the other thing that um, that is important, I've noticed for aging, is muscle. And, uh, you know, I, I think we, we have a neglected organ, which is our muscle, that we yeah. don't pay much attention to. And and this condition that we get as we age, and it's inexorable. Like, if you don't do something to stop it aggressively, you will lose muscle. So you could be the same weight at 65 than you are at 25, but your body be twice as fat. And it literally looks like a ribeye marble steak as opposed to a filet mignon, which is what you want for your muscle with no fat rippling through it. That's all related to uh, our diet and, and the lack of exercise. And, right. and so the two things I want you to talk about is the other side of the coin, because protein you need and you want to get enough but not too much, but it's actually sugar and starch that drive this aging process. And right. then th that combined with muscle strengthening and building as you get older seems to be some of the most important factors. So can you talk about those and how they relate to aging? Sure. Well, sugar and starches are the devil. There's no, I mean, we don't, that, you know, it's not even a debate. You've got to get as much of that out of your diet as possible. Um, so, you, you, you know, you want to eat, the protein is, is a harder one, how much protein you eat. And I think as you get older, maybe decreasing animal protein, increasing a bit of plant protein, but still keeping those carbohydrates as low as possible or the the sugars and the starches right i think that the muscle issue is interesting you know because i've been doing acupuncture for so long and i really got into the functioning of the muscles so it's not just about building muscle you want those muscles to work efficiently and what i see a lot of especially as we get older and we have injuries certain muscle groups tighten up and when certain muscles tighten up and they don't fire your body compensates and starts using other muscles. So let's say you have a tight hip or you have an ankle problem. Your, your, your back muscles have to work more and then you start getting back pains and then maybe it work goes up to your shoulders. So not only do you have to improve muscle um, mass or watch the loss of muscle as you get older, you've got to watch that functioning because as we get older, yeah. those muscles tighten and the fascia tightens that, that, um, thin layer that surrounds the muscles. Like, you know, when you cut open a chicken and there's this fascia around the muscles, that surrounds all our muscles in our body. And that, mm. as an acupuncturist and, and paying a lot of attention to that for the last 30 years, I've seen becomes a problem, especially as we get older and as we injure ourselves. And especially as we get older and we injure ourselves, we don't tend to to uh, re recover as well. So it's really important when you do injure yourself um, to get some body work, to get some acupuncture, to get those muscles w working efficiently again and yeah. not just letting um, injuries sit there and not treat them. So I think it's not only building muscle mass and not losing or not losing muscle mass, but it's improving the muscle efficiency and that's keeping those muscles long and, and, and limber and, and watching that the fascia doesn't tighten. That's a really good point, Frank, because uh, I've had back issues my whole life from um, back surgery when I was 30 and recently had another back surgery. And uh, now I'm, I'm getting treated by this physical therapist who's going into the fascia and rewiring yeah. things and then giving me exercise to do that compensate for the inactive muscles, that exactly what you were talking about. And it's, I, it's been only like three days of working with this person and I feel like a different human being. Uh, my yeah. body feels limber, lighter, opener. It's pretty amazing. So I, I mean, not everybody can access that, but it's it's there's ways you can do it yourself with foam rollers and other that, things to really 
to really help. Okay, so let's talk about something that and, and, is... And in the book, I talk about foam rolling. I think you, I just have to mention foam rolling because I think that is, you know, a lot of people can't afford going to some a body worker who does deep tissue work, but foam rolling is sort of the closest you'll get to going to someone who can do that. I really, I can't stress this enough. You know, recovering from injuries, recuperating, don't let those muscles tighten because the way our body works is to compensate and tighten somewhere else or overuse another muscle. It's really important to have those muscles working efficiently. It's one area of functional medicine that we didn't really get into in functional medicine. We talked about most of the other organs, but we didn't really talk about the functioning of the musculoskeletal system. Yeah. I think that is really important. Well, it's definitely one of the nodes on the matrix, which is structural, but if we don't get into it enough, I agree. And actually, right. we're talking about building a whole course on a structural module. So I think right. that's very important. Yeah. All right, let's, let's talk about something that is a little abstract, but is really mm -hmm. central to aging and that is impacted by our diet, uh, light, by exercise, by environmental toxins. Uh, and it's something called our mitochondria. And we've talked about that on the show a little bit before, but it's, it's really important. So what are mitochondria? Why are they so important in aging and disease? And how do we improve them? Because it seems to be the central feature of aging is the dysfunction and the loss of mitochondria. Right. So the mitochondria are just the energy powerhouses in the cells, and you have many in, in, in all our cells. And as we get older, uh, the number decreases and their function decreases. So uh, optimizing their function and trying to increase their number is one of the most important things you can do for aging. And interestingly enough, most of the things we've been talking about improve mitochondrial function or increase the number. We'll mention a yes. couple of others we haven't, but it's a low carbohydrate diet or or you know fats are what the mitochondria thrive on. Um, fasting is particularly good, particularly good for mitochondria. Exercise, in particularly um, high-intensity interval training, um, is really good for it. Strength training as well. So uh, sleep. A lot of the lifestyle changes. You know, to me, the mitochondria are what we in Chinese medicine talk about. Qi. We talk about the energy and how do you boost chi. To me, the mitochondria are the Western equivalent to chi. That's your body's energy. And all these changes we talk about actually work with the mitochondria. What, one of the things we, we haven't talked about and which actually are, um, works, seems to work well or stimulate the mitochondria is um, this concept called hormesis, mm. uh, which is I love that of, concept. What does uh, that mean? What does that mean? I love that concept. So hormesis means sort of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, basically. Ah, that's perfect definition. That's the best uh, definition I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little bit of stress is actually good for the body. You know, you know, chronic stress we know is a problem and creates all these problems and, and, and it, it will help, um, won't help you age well, but a little bit of stress, hormesis is good. And that's what fasting is. Fasting is physical hormesis. It's a stress. It's a, a little bit of mild stress on the body and your body's uh, response to that. And, and we talked about resilience, but your body's response to that will be in, in, is a positive response, which stimulates all these factors that are good for aging. So mm -hmm. we talk about fasting. We talk about a little bit of interval training where you push yourself a little bit more than usual. Um, going from hot to cold. So even just having an ice cold shower after a hot shower, you know, I love going from a sauna. I've become obsessed with my sauna, going from my sauna, jumping into some freezing cold water. So, you know, temperature extremes are another way of, of stimulating hormesis. Um, what yeah, I love that. You? I love that. I love, I love going from my steam or sauna right into an ice bath. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good for aging. I mean, that's yeah. good. That's hormesis. So anything that's a little bit of stress on the body is good. And actually what's interesting, I remember years ago at Jeff Bland talking about this or someone at one of the functional medicine con uh, con uh, conferences um, with phytonutrients. A lot of the hormesis is really good for plants. 
So plants develop more antioxidants and, and um, protective phytonutrients to protect themselves from whatever they have to deal with to, to survive. So spraying them with um, herbicides and that doesn't actually help them develop these phytonutrients to protect themselves, which actually end up being good for us too. Yes. So the first time I heard about hormesis was years and years ago at one of the functional medicine con conferences where someone, I think it was Jeff, who talked about the importance of hormesis on plants and developing you know, yeah. phytonutrients that would then benefit us. Yeah, you know, it's really important to understand this idea because when you look at, for example, organic versus conventional plants or even wild plants, even versus organic plants, the wild plants have way more by hundreds to thousands of times more antioxidant potential, phytonutrient compound, and they also taste better. And what's interesting is that flavor goes along with phytonutrients. <laughs> so the flavor profile of a food is directly related to the nutrient density and to the phytochemical content. So if you go to a garden, which I did the other day to a friend of mine's garden, and you pick a really ripe tomato that's just ripened on the vine, you stick it in your mouth, and it's an explosion yeah. of taste and flavor and phytochemicals that is so different than these cardboard store-bought tomatoes that don't taste like anything. So exactly. that's really the power of, of the little stresses. And I think the strength training, the hit interval training, the, the, the fasting, the phytochemicals, these are all ways to actually improve this. If you love that last video, you should check out the next one for sure on getting to the root cause of all disease. Actually creating this environment today where we have inflammatory foods as a normal part of our diet. We have a high level exposure to chemicals that are not being tested and they're being 